So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is a workshop in a series of, of uh, workshops and symposium that we organize in Metal. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, I mean, haven't been to our events before, uh, I'll just say a couple of words about Metal. Metal is the Israeli inter-university center for knowledge in learning technologies. So we provide uh, what we call uh, a basket, I don't know if that's the right word, Sala Technologiot, but basket doesn't say, basket of technologies to academic institutions in Israel. We work on a membership basis, so all the universities, most of the colleges in Israel are members of Maital and benefit from our services. Apart from providing access to technologies, we provide uh, training and professional development. We have our annual conference, which is, I think, the biggest learning technologies event in Israel, definitely with a focus on higher education. And we run a lot of workshops, seminars, symposium. Uh, we run two courses. One is a course for lecturers uh, who want to upscale their, their skills in, in uh, using technology in the classroom. And another is a course for learning technologists, what we call in Hebrew technopedagogy. Um, and that's just, and we participate in many European projects. So if you're here from well, London isn't in Europe anymore. Sorry, guys. But uh, if you are from Europe and, and you, I mean, we can look for financial uh, uh, opportunities as well. But if you're from Europe and you're looking for partners for Erasmus or Horizon, give us a call. And that's that's the end of the intro on, on Metal. Usually Eli, who's a manager of Metal, will do this, but uh, he's unfortunately in another meeting now. Today, we're going to talk about task-based technology enhanced language learning. And uh, of course, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, this reflects work that Lai and myself have been doing over the last couple of years. And we have a website, which um, you'll also see bits of it throughout the workshop that uh, share this work. We have some, a few publications um, already in press, some, some um, uh, coming. And uh, we thought that it's time to kind of open this work to, to an, a larger audience and, and practitioners and so on. So uh, at this, so what we're going to do today is uh, that I will give a brief introduction to task-based tech enhanced language learning. Laya, between the two of us, is the language expert, language learning expert. Uh, I will talk a bit about signature pedagogies uh, really a little bit about that and, and why we'll use signature pedagogy as a framework. And then we'll share some design principles and design patterns, and we'll explain what those are in case you don't know, don't worry. Um, and then we'll do some work of trying to derive design patterns from your personal experience. All right. So uh, at this point, I'll stop sharing and, uh, and turn over. Right. Okay, so give me just a second to put up my slide. Um, and by the way, if at any point anybody has any question, you know, feel free to use the chat. And if we don't notice the chat, just open the microphone. Um, we want to be, you know, as participatory as and inclusive as possible. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, so um, I was going to just explain a little bit why, um, why we chose task-based technology and hence language learning and where that comes from. Um, so basically, um, technology, uh, um, sorry, task-based language teaching has, is one of the main um, approaches used to teaching languages, to teaching foreign languages. Um, and uh, it's particularly um, uh, suitable for, for the use of technology. Um, and we chose um, also um, to name uh, the technology enhanced bit um, um, because originally in the field, um, the term that was used was uh, call or computer assisted language learning. 
and uh, or also mobile assisted language learning. And uh, those terms became a bit obsolete. Um, uh, also computer mediated communication, all those terms became obsolete because now we don't only use computers and um, but we use different technologies uh, to learn languages basically. So the term that we propose that we use um, um, in our work is technology enhanced language learning. But I wanted to you know, show you that the terms actually have a history and they come from, from a long tradition um, and so this is the technology, uh, the terminology bit. Um, Task-based language teaching, um, so the focus is obviously, like the name says, it, the focus is on task, on the use of authentic tasks as, as the, the, the main uh, mean of language instruction. Um, and tasks, as uh, Alice uh, defined, uh, have to focus mainly on meaning, on conveying information uh, using language or using linguistic resources or mainly linguistic resources. Um, and the issue where, where, where we, where we um, began is that online communication at this point um, have, you know, have um, given um, another perspective and we, we use the tasks that were authentic before now are, are, are different, right? Uh, what we are doing now, like this, you know, sort of uh, seminar um, could be one of the tasks. So the authentic tasks that before were, I don't know, write a letter of complaint or, or book a, a hotel room, this kind of tasks were brought into the language classroom. Now uh, we have to also include tasks as the ones we are doing now, right? So the term authentic uh, has broadened a little bit. Um, and technology enhanced language learning, um, like I said before, with other terminology, other names, um, has also gone through different stages. It started in the 60s, 70s, um, using what they, they call behaviorism, uh, behaviorism, basically. So they were using devices mainly to like, practice and, and giving drill exercises on on grammar, pronunciation, and all, all the rest of it. Then um, language learning um, got into the communicative um, um, approach, and then communication was at the center of it. And in terms of, of technology use, it was mainly learning and computer interaction. Um, and then the last phase um, involved issues of integrating um, the computer into the normal language teaching, right? So the computer is both um, a medium and also a source of information, a medium um, that learners use to communicate, and obviously the source of information that the, that the web provides, right? Um, I'm giving here a quote uh, by one of the main authors in, in Call Tell um, that um, you know, just um, emphasizes that the, the medium uh, um, is, is not the focus, but uh, how it's put to use, right? Um, so, um, and then our interest also was to integrate this um, TBLT and call or tell um, because the fields have been um, showing mutual interest, right? So it's obvious that when we do a tasks and um, when we mainly focus on tasks for language teaching. And, um, and like I said, the tasks um, um, have to incorporate all these new tasks that we are doing um, in the world. Um, so the importance of tasks, um, when we use different devices, when we use the technology um, is particularly suitable. Um, also, um, it's interesting the, the design bit, right? So we have to think how we design these tasks. And um, therefore, um, there's a need for these two fields to talk, right? To communicate. And there has been work done um, mainly by uh, Gonzalez Lloret and Ortega um, about how to integrate technology and, uh, and task-based language teaching. And what we're doing now is just um, another instantiation of this. And I think now it's over to you, Yishai. 
Thank you. So uh, oh, I have to stop sharing, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, I could actually hijack your screen, but that's fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so the idea is that you know, uh, let's say I want to teach language, and I've been talking today, and I'm convinced that the way to teach language is technology enhanced task-based language teaching but i want to do how to, I want, uh, okay how do we do it how do i do it and I said well you know there's all these papers and uh you can read it and i said well you know i already have my phd i don't have time to do a second one right so so what we were looking here is is a way of packaging this methodology sort of distilling knowledge from the literature and trying to uh, to to um, to package it in a way that will be accessible for practitioners. And here um, I, I I go to uh, uh, Lee Schulman, and Lee Schulman introduced the idea of of signature pedagogies. Now he introduced it as a way of understanding the knowledge within the profession, the way that uh, if you say, it says, if you want to understand a culture, study its nurseries. If you want to understand a profession, study the place where, where those professionals are, are, uh, are educated. So the idea is what we see as the nature of knowledge in the domain is reflected in how we teach in the domain. Right, but there's more to signature pedagogies, and they've been used by uh, by many people recently uh, as a way of encapsulating uh, a methodological or pedagogical framework. Right, so the idea is a signature pedagogy has, uh, according to Schumann, three um, three structure, three dimension. There is a surface structure, which is what we see. When we go into a classroom, we see a teacher standing at the whiteboard and talking, or we see a teacher who divides our students to groups and walks around the, the classroom between them. So this is what we can observe, right? What we observe reflects a deeper structure, and that is a set of assumptions about how to teach how people learn, right? And that actually uh, reflects uh, a deeper and implicit structure that is more normative, that says, you know, what people should learn. So if, I, and, and let's, let's look at some, you know, if I stand in lecture, as I'm doing now, I assume that you learn by listening, right? Which in a way says that I want you to be obedient. I think that the, the implicit values that I'm promoting is, you know, sit down and listen to authority, right? But if I um, teach by, say, um, you know, like we do in, in, in legal education by analyzing, analyzing and debating a le legal case, I assume that you learned by arguing, right? And in a way, I'm trying to train you to, to be a bit argumentative, a bit feisty, a bit, you know, uh, to stand your ground, right? Um, if I teach you by simulation, I assume that you learn by attending to, to details, to, to uh, human actions, to um, communication, to tone of voice and so on. And in a way, I think, I'm promoting a, a value of empathy, right? So if I do a simulation, say in medical education or any care education, yes, I'm trying to teach some content, right? It might be how you interview or how you uh, accept a patient in, in ER or so on. So there is some procedure that you're, that is a content that I'm teaching, but there's also a subtext, which is the implicit level. Okay. So how do we represent these? And I'll uh, flip through this quite quickly. The implicit structure reflects our beliefs, our values, our learning theories. And um, normally when, when I work with was uh, trying to articulate um, uh, signature pedagogy, then 
I'll start by trying to uncover what are the beliefs and values which underpin uh, this pedagogical approach. The deep structure we will represent through pedagogical principles, epistemic principles, and the surface structure through design patterns. Now, uh, just to explain what are principles, maybe, um, no, so, so the idea about a design principle, this is a term that's used predominantly an intuitive way. It comes from design practices, uh, whether it's architecture or UX design, or you know, in any design practice, you'll see people talk about design principles. And these have been uh, imported or adapted into educational design. So the idea is I take some theoretical knowledge and and then funnel it or, or uh, project it into practice. I formulate it in imperative form. And, um, and then this imperative will require any practitioner to interpret it based on the circumstances in which you want to apply the pattern. The pattern is in that sense, and that is uh, the quotation here from Bell, Hoadley and Lynn, is not a falsifiable uh, scientific claim in in the um, um, you know in the Popperian sense, uh, because in order to see if it really works or not, you need to interpret it, implement it, and then observe its effects. Right, and it has often a sort of an ethical stance behind it. So it's not just saying this works, but you should do this because it reflects a certain set of values. So in this point, we'll stop and, and I'll, I'll stop and I'll turn back over to you, Laia, to explain how we derived the set of patterns that we're going to show you. Um, I put a link to the website in the chat so you can also look at those pat, uh, uh, principles Sorry, as we discuss them. And in fact, we will want you to, to actively comment on these on some of these principles in a few minutes. Okay, so let me forward to the yeah, to the design uh, you went, principles. Went one, you went one too many, I think. Yeah, that's really it. this. Okay, now you're on the All right. right. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So so mainly what we did in, in our in our project is um, we tried to mine these principles. And we did it uh, following this uh, Delphi study um, um, protocol. Um, so what we did is uh, first we went to the literature on, on technology enhanced language learning, on computer assisted language learning. And uh, we looked for, um, in the literature, we looked for um, these principles in, in mostly theoretical uh, papers. Um, and then we gathered uh, about 15 principles that we could find in the literature. And those 15 principles, we, um, we send them uh, to a panel of experts in the field, some of them authors of those papers. Um, and then we ask them to rate the principles and uh, to comment on them. So basically we, we said, do you agree that these are essential principles of fast-paced technology enhanced language learning. And um, we did that in, a, in, a, in an iterative process. I mean, we did it twice. So first we presented the principles, we gathered comments, and then we refined um, these principles and we asked them to rate them again to see if, um, if they, they reach consensus. So, um, we established that consensus was like above 70% of agreement with the principle. Um, and, um, and they came back, I think eight of the principles reached that agreement and the other ones um, you know, didn't, didn't manage to, to reach that 70%. Um, so after, um, after doing this, uh, yeah. So we, we will present you the, the design principles and, and I will, I will just uh, explain one or two of them um, so that you see how they are formulated. Um, so first we have design principles that are uh, what we call uh, task-based language teaching specific. Um, so for instance, the first one and obvious one 
uh, if you click on the principal, it will take you to the website uh, where we have the principal listed. Um, so the first one just basically says uh, use tasks as the as the base uh, unit of instruction, and that would be um, kind of obvious in a TBLT task-based language teaching language uh, approach. Um, so here, basically, also I wanted to, to show you that we have the each principal listed on the website, and at any point we are you know we we can ask uh, people to agree. Uh, uh, with this principle as well. Um, it's open on the website and it's, uh, maybe some of the things that you can do at your own time, because we maybe, don't have time for that. Do we have no, time let, for let's, that? Let's, let's have, let's have uh, you know, let's use the opportunity. So we ran this, mm -hmm. what you see here is actually the same question that we sent to, um, to, to the, the experts. experts. Yeah. And what we want to do is, as one of the, the next stages in this project, is also to open up uh, this for, uh, for a kind of an open survey on the wider community, since you're all here um, part of the language teaching community. So we will appreciate your uh, inputs on, on this principle and then on, on the rest of the principles. So for it, if, oh it uh, for instance, you're asking, do teachers all agree on what the task is? I would really appreciate if you would respond to the form on the page and put that question in the comment. So, so we have it on record and it doesn't get lost in the, in the stream of, of uh, our, um, um, sorry, the stream of the Zoom session, right? All right, all right. Okay, so let's give this two minutes and uh, yeah, let's, uh, and then we can actually look at the form and see uh, if we have some interesting result there. And just to respond also to audit a, a little bit about the agreement on, on what, what the teachers, what teachers think about tasks. I mean, we sort of, you see that we sort of motivate each principal and we sometimes provide a little bit of, uh, of um, references so that they know what we mean by tasks. And mostly it's Alice's work that we are following to define what a task is. Yeah, I'll put the li direct link to the form in the chat in case that, uh, but, but yes, you can reach uh, the, the form through the website or directly through this thing. So I see we have, uh, we're starting to get some responses, which is nice. Uh, so far, only votes without any comments. Um, uh, so an interesting comment, the task-based teaching is a way to engage learners, not necessarily for assessment. Um, they shouldn't relate to the intended learning outcomes and learning goals. That definitely, uh, I can identify with that. Um, I wonder about this, that you know, the tasks are a good way to engage learners, but not necessarily for assessment. Elia, do you want to respond to that? Well, um, task-based language teaching says that also assessment, I mean, when you assess, you assess the outcome of a task, right? So a task can be uh, pretty much anything that uh, that you do using, like I said, linguistic, mostly linguistic um, um, resources. So it can be um, doing a presentation, uh, it can be writing a complaint, it can be anything, and that is an outcome, right? So you have you have um, something, an outcome that then you can assess. And you can decide how you want to assess it. Yeah, and so, you can so also decide, decide that you want to ask, uh, assess the process of, you know, doing that task. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, there's some questions coming up here. First, do we agree on what it means, what a task is, how to define a task, and also relationship between task based learning, project based learning, 
problem-based learning, I would add to that. So I think there is definitely some input here that can help us refine uh, this principle and, and you know, kind of add more detail to what we mean by a task. How does this relate to other methodologies and so on? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so shall we move on? To sure. I, if I can just add, uh, the, the reason I think that at least I feel that I'm raising this issue is Again, we're, we're dealing with uh, an English or reform with English inside of Israel and the high, higher education. It's supposed to go throughout the whole education system. So when I speak with teachers and, I, and they feel like they are doing a task which is active and I say, how do you say uh, sheep and mutton? There's like, you know, there's the, it just, it's not, you're not, you're basically going back to that surface level of, you know, it's like, do, do you see what I'm saying? So I feel like, how do I, is there a way to communicate to teachers? This is like you were talking just now about outcomes, right? So that's something mm -hmm. I can bring that language with my teachers and say, okay, can we talk about the outcome? What is the student doing? And what is, so anyway, that's, that's why for me, that's why I was asking this question. So you're saying if you tell your students watch this video and then uh, do the quiz, it's not a task. Not a task. <laughs> right? right. The fact that right. I told them to do something doesn't make it a task, right? And, and I think this is a, a very good point and something we need to kind of refine and clarify. Okay, shall we go on? Uh, sure. What is the next principle you want us to, to look at? Yeah, another one that is related, very much related to, to tasks is learning by doing, right? So we use language um, to do something. Um, and the principle, you have it here. So basically is promote, right? Like Orid was saying, promote learning by doing something using the language. And often and we added the technological bit, right? Mediated by artifacts or technology to produce an output, right? Mm -hmm. So also, if you wanna, uh, I can share the link directly in the chat to this. I shared the link. Oh, you did it? Okay. I'll, I'll share the links. Uh, there's also a comment in the, in the chat about um, another is um, useful concept is action oriented approach. Yes, yeah, so, so Daniel, again, if you can post that comment in the form, then you know we, we'll have a record of it and we can go back to it. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, what was CEFR? I'm familiar with the is the common European framework for language. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, that's a common European framework for language teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and that framework specifies that you want an action-oriented approach. That's right. That's at that's at the the center of of uh, the CFR is the sort of real world task mm -hmm. and that uh, people are getting things done. Uh, with language and also without language, as, as you had said yeah. before. So mm -hmm. I, I think that that might help to maybe focus in terms of when we're talking about a task is that it's an action-oriented uh, approach to things. Mm -hmm. Right, so you're saying it, it gives us a good framing in the sense because, well, this this is directly related to, to what the European Union expects. Indeed. Right. So one of the comments that we're getting about the second principle is that to create meaningful outputs, we need to start with useful inputs, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and we do have yeah. actually a set we, of- We do have a set of principles that talk about inputs. Which yes. relates specifically to the input. So- Maybe uh, we can go to that one next. Okay, well, let, let's give it let's a, see all yeah, the let's see people let's are see all the responding. So, um, and then there's a question, when you say meaningful, do we mean meaningful in, in the real life outside the classroom or meaningful in the context of the classroom? I, I think that's a very good question. You know, what's meaningful for me is that 
you know, want to pass the exam. So, <laughs> so uh, but that's not really what we're looking for in this principle. So, so I think we need to maybe a bit elaborate a bit about what we mean by mm -hmm. meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, meaningful to the student, meaningful within the context of, of their life and so on. Um, I think that's... And also within the context of, of, of language, right? I mean, Meaningful meaning, meaning uh, you want to say something. Uh, you just don't want to complete an exercise for the sake of it, but you have something to say, right? Or something to say. It can be, again, linguistic or non-linguistic ways of saying, uh, mm. convey something. Yeah, so somebody said meaningful is the individualized construct. If I understand that comment, I, I think I agree, and it's a bit of in a way, what you were saying, Laya, right? That mm -hmm. it's meaningful for me as a learner, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's a bit, meaning is is definitely individual, but then language is always communicational, so it has to be also meaningful, I guess, in a social context as well, right? Right. Okay. So, uh, so which which uh, what what do you want us to, to look at next? Maybe we can look at this uh, principle. That has to do with the. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, with the input, right? Um, can I go back the slides? Yeah, you should be able to just about should be able, right? Because I don't find the one. Um, let me see if I can go back. Sorry. Yes, I can go back. Um, Maybe a bit more. Yeah. Mm. Oh, input linguistic complexity. I think it's the one on uh, complexity. Do you want to look at and inputs characteristics? Which one do you want to go to? Um, maybe let's go to the inputs one. Input um, characteristics. Right. Yes. So this one um, is talking about it's related to one of the comments. So we need to provide rich and comprehensible input. Uh, derived from competent language users um, in a variety of situations. And we added also that includes different varieties, accents, um, but also, and that's a complex part, adjusted to the level of learners, because sometimes the authentic input is too complicated, too complex for, say, the beginners. So there's this tension between providing authentic input uh, and then managing the level of students. This is this is just so wonderful because again, with my head so full in the reform now and talking with teachers, that's that's exactly, the, I'm, I'm just saying very real world experiences of teachers when I'm saying, I really feel this, what you're mm -hmm. saying here. Yeah, and I think this is, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, I was working with uh, or, uh, at the Open U and you know, working with the BBC and uh, about language, te teaching language as a second language. And it's, uh, there's always an issue of, you know, you teach kind of a textbook, Queen's English, or, or you give you know, a variety of inputs which reflect um, language use in the real world, right? So, so um, I think this is a very, very important uh, issue, which perhaps novices are less aware of. Um, yes, yeah, selected and adjusted, but authentic. So of course, you don't pick any uh, TikTok videos as as input you you need to select and you need to again select based on the learning objectives and so on um but but uh but definitely always stay attentive yeah do we have any uh, comments already uh, yeah i see somebody is connecting this to the issue of linguistic complexity if the content is mm -hmm. interesting enough, students will make the extra effort to overcome the complexity, which relates to the other uh, principle that you wanted to show. Mm -hmm. 
there's the issue of, of linguistic bias and discrimination. And I suppose that goes back to being very careful in our selection of, of inputs, because these selection of input always reflect, uh, in a way, a, a sort of an ethical stance, right? So, yeah. which, you know, by, by highlighting a certain input, we're highlighting a certain um group within society and and you know so that always reflects our our values right mm -hmm. um and then it goes back to the input has to relate to the student being meaningful um so that's i i wonder if it's something that is might be difficult to i mean you know what is authentic and and relevant and meaningful for one student might not be for another Right. Right. Um, so I guess this this always has to be contextualized per the actual cohort you're teaching, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and the idea of including non-native varieties of language, or I mean, uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, when if you're teaching English. Uh, then it do, uh, even native varieties um, have a lot of diversity, right? So if do you include Glasgonian or Gorgi? I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, there are certain varieties of language which even for native English speakers are sometimes hard to follow. So uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and we, we said um, we also included um, competent language to use this because we didn't want to um, just imply that uh, the models of, for instance, for English should come for, from native speakers, because mm -hmm. in the end, our learners um, will most likely have to speak to other non-native speakers. So mm -hmm. the inputs should also come from non-native speakers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yeah, what you were saying before about the authenticity, I was also thinking like a lot of the authenticity depends of the input depends on the if we are in a task based language teaching um, if you follow that approach it has to also match um, at the goal of the task right so what language input does the learner need in order to be able to um, carry out the task at, at state right so mm -hmm. it's, it's it's very contextualized. It's very context dependent on the on the task in this case. May I may I make a comment? Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, so in term, you're mentioning meaningful, and um, I think you know we're talking here about um, tell. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that really affords us a lot of opportunities because in the past, if I you know, gave my students kind of a, a book and said, okay, uh, these are the articles or whatever we're going to be looking at. Now what I can do is provide a, a database of, of things that are level appropriate or content appropriate and say, you know, go ahead and choose or even, you know, a collection in, in a certain website, for example, that I've looked at. So mm -hmm. I think that allows for, a, in, in terms of meaningful input, that, that mm -hmm. certainly allows for that. Right. Well, that, that also speaks directly to the principle of, of personalization, which mm -hmm. is another principle that we have uh, further down. Uh, and, and it also suggests a very good example of how technology affords personalization, even without getting into AI and automated teaching systems, because you say, well, you know, I want you to analyze one of these texts, or I want you to analyze one of these videos, and just giving students choice has the effect of personalization and empowerment and so on. And, and then it connects to, to the idea of, of they choose what they find meaningful for themselves and so on. So uh, I wonder, Laya, do you think mm -hmm. we should go through more principles one by one, or maybe we can just uh, give everyone a few minutes to browse the site and pick the principles that they find interesting. And then, you know, maybe just we'll stop yeah. sharing screen and let everyone tell us, you know, which principles they're 
kind of they find interesting and want to comment on and just you know open okay. up. sounds good i'll stop sharing yeah so mm -hmm. yeah so i'll i'll remove the the spotlights and then uh uh we can you know so so the idea is now just like i shared the link to the website in the uh in the chat to the specifically to the uh principles section and what i'd like everyone to do now is just open the website go through the principles find the ones that you find interesting or the ones that you strongly disagree with or that you find unclear and you know whenever first of all you can fill in the form and and comment on them but because i can't follow 16 forms uh, simultaneously so maybe once you've made a comment just open your microphone and tell us which principle you're 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 kind of you have something to say about and and we'll discuss it okay does anybody want to comment on hi good morning yeah. hi can you hear me yes um so uh, my name is dana and i would like to start uh, break the ice uh, with a comment on uh, the part of learning processes and uh, point number seven so meaning versus form so mm -hmm. in my knowledge and past experience in teaching when we approached language we looked at three coordinates so the meaning of the vocabulary or the grammar the form and the pronunciation and so my my point is in trying to support learners to acquire to learn new language elements we have to or should or we need to <laughs> touch on all the three coordinates because otherwise if i know the meaning of a word but i'm not able to articulated in its form, if I'm not able to form, for example, um, a verb uh, tense or uh, the plural, etc., and if I'm not able to pronounce it, then mm, the uh, outcome of my communication is not, is not clear enough, is not defined enough, is not effective, and it can also be problematic <laughs> when, uh, you know, in some languages, pronunciation uh, differentiates meaning. Form can have an impact on the meaning. So, my comment is that yes, meaning is important, but so is form and so is pronunciation. And I think they're interconnected and they should be sort of tackled all together. Mm -hmm. So before you respond, Lai, I think Tal uh, commented in the chat on this specific principle as well. So Tal, if, if you perhaps want to respond to Dana, if not, then fine, but... Uh... Which I thought maybe you have something to add on this point. I can just say that I think it's it's a, it's a constant debate that we all face as language experts in the field of uh, epic um, form versus meaning, meaning versus form, fluency versus accuracy, accuracy versus fluency. What should get more weight? To what extent do we model, do we monitor, to what extent do we allow free communication as long as the message comes across? And I think it lies at the heart of anything that we do as language experts. And uh, it doesn't matter which, which level one deals with, pre-A1 all the way up to, T, to C2. And when we uh, develop our rubrics and when we think about the way we either formatively or, or summatively assess our students' um, performance and outcomes, this is always in the back of our mind. And I don't think there is a formula, one good formula that allows us to, to hold on to and to lean on and develop our teaching. And I think if this, um, if this point could have been cracked better in a more quantified way, it would have really revolutionized in a way our field, because I think that's where our biggest dilemma lies. That's all I can say. And I'm sorry, I can't open my camera. 
that that's fine. Um, I understand we all have limitation. I also use a you know um, blurred background today because of the room I'm in. Uh, but but thank you, thank you for that contribution. I think it's uh, so. I think um, if if you could both comment, you know, on on the website, so we have a record of. of of your and and again everyone else we, we appreciate even after the session if you go through those principles and rate them and comment on them and share them with your colleagues so we get as much input we can and and we continue to refine these principles um and i think these are very very important points and laia do you want to respond or um yeah i mean i was wondering also rosalie also had something to say about this principle mm. perhaps uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I I second what uh, what what everybody has said and what Tal just uh, just explained, and this has always been one of my uh, one of my biggest uh, problems, particularly when when it comes to assessment, uh, whether I I, uh, I focus on meaning or form. Mm -hmm. And uh, in recent uh, in recent years, I have uh, especially since we've been focusing more and more on on, on integrating four skills simultaneously. Um, uh, I think I have been placing the stress much more on the overall communication process. If the student succeeds in communicating the ideas uh, clearly enough, so that or understandably, uh, uh, I think I, I, I value that much more than possibly accuracy. Uh, and that has uh, that has solved my problem, especially when it comes to assessing writing, um, uh, which which is always sort of like the, the key. I mean, you, you can okay, let's let's say speaking, you know, you manage to communicate the idea because you also have, of course, paralinguistic elements that come in, you know, gestures, body language, tone, uh, and other and other. Um, uh, features that facilitate an, uh, comprehension. But when you write and, and, and you want to communicate ADS, you don't have these extra uh, helpers. And, and so that's why I think communication and how we understand communication should really be uh, part, of the, part of the debate or a key of the debate. Uh, perhaps it could be like the overarching principle that, that, that groups all the, all the others. And, and the other thing that I wanted to, um, to say uh, after reading the, the list very carefully, and, and I really like it, um, is we're, all, we're always focusing on the learner, and we forget that the teacher is a learner too, um, a continuous learner. And in other words, you know, um, we have to we have to form ourselves all the time. We have to continue learning, um, and 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 as as you say, especially the second, the last section of of, of the list of principles. Um, they apply to teachers almost as, as much as students. In other words, the, the techno-pedagogical literacy, uh, confidence, and so on. These are things that we have to foment in teachers as much as in learners. In other words, it, it's like two sides of, of the same, of the same um, point. Uh, yeah, point or figure, you know, sort of like I'm a teacher now, but I'm a learner tomorrow, and and I'm both at the same time. It's uh, it, it's hard for me to explain, but uh, but I certainly see it like, like like now, you know, when we want to share all this knowledge with with our colleagues, and we want to get our you know, like now that we're in Israel, we're in the midst of this epic reform, and we want to get all teachers on board. Um, they're really learners. I mean, we are learners um, at the same time. We may be a little bit ahead of them, of the other learners in terms of the technopedagogical aspect of things. Um, and I think this is just something to, to bear in mind and to think about the whole time, that we have to train our teachers as much as we have to train our students. Uh, it's, it's, thank you, <laughs> to communicate. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. I think, yeah, well, uh, um, about the communicative part, I think, and about what uh, um, the, the other comment, right? Um, I think the main thing is we frame this within the task-based language teaching approach, which gives the meaning, right? The meaning to the to the task itself, and a task can be many things, and it can be it can be 
um, an oral exercise where three people have to agree on something. Uh, so the task really gives, I think, gives the layer of communicative intent and uh, and to to all the, that the students need to do, right? Um, so that was my my comment, like that we are within that uh, framework and. I don't know if that makes sense to everyone. I, I want to say, I, I know it's um, I just, you know, listening to this conversation about meaning versus form and articulation, I'm reminded, and sorry about this, if this is a <laughs> bit um, quirky, but uh, did everyone see uh, Life of Brian? Right, and there's a scene where Brian is sent. Hang on, Brian is sent by the underground uh, to write Romans go home. Remember, and then the the Roman centaur comes and and you know gives him a lesson in Latin, which only when I moved to England I realized how much that lesson is is kind of a reflection of probably Monty Python's experience in in grammar schools in England but but the point I want to make is that there's when we say meaning before form or, or emphasize meaning over form and I think there's an expression of of a deep social ethical value here right that you know, meaning is is about as 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 you said, Rosa, It's about communication. It's about self expression. It's about so if I manage to express myself, but I misspelled or or mispronounced, you know, what do we emphasize? Uh, and, and I think this really you know relates to a lot of class and equity issues as well. So so I think you know there's. Definitely a lot to 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 debate about this principle and not not neglecting what Dan was saying that well in the end of the day, if you don't pronounce it right, then people won't understand what you're saying. So, you know, we're not saying, you know, completely neglect form or 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 articulation, but but you know it's a question of where the emphasis is. I, I want to before we move on. Um, and again, I would be really, really happy if you know you take some time later today to go through the all the principles and comment on them and share them with your colleagues and so on. So, so we can benefit from your input. Uh, there was one comment that somebody made about a principle. Let me see which one it was. Um, yeah, principle eleven about collaborative learning, and. The response was that um, there's a tension between collaborative learning and assessment, because obviously when and this is something that you know we know very well from PBL that the more students work collaboratively, the harder it is to to assess them individually, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if if somebody wants <laughs> to comment on that or. I think maybe one of the design patterns that we will present deals with that issue. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so um, does anybody want to? Um, I mean, is, is there any more comments at this point, or questions, or or uh, does this framework make sense? I mean, do you think that presenting the methodology through a, a set of sixteen principles is useful for you as practitioners, for, for your colleagues, for people you work with? Do you think we should share these principles with our students as well? So, you know, they understand why we're teaching in the way we're teaching. I don't know if anybody wants to relate to that. Sheila, you're nodding. So I don't know if you want to open the mic and I think I think this is a very useful way to formalize something that has been like an intuition I, for myself. I don't I don't want to speak for anyone else. But so we have this like tendencies in our teaching and we differ from one another and then formalize it. So I can say, yes, I'm more in favor of collaborative work, for example, while my colleague is more, you know, favors another principle over that. So so that I think it's very useful. I would hesitate to share this with the students. Um, 
I think it's a bit theoretical for them to, to see that this is an underlying principle. Um, so that's my. So okay. if, if I can just jump in, Shira, I, I first of all want to tell you, and I, I feel that so much because I feel exactly the same way that there's a lot of this from experience as being a teacher teaching language. So every time I see this kind of theoretical framework, I go, oh, thank God. Right. So the more I learn, the more I feel like, OK, I, I feel strengthened and I feel that I can aim better and do a better job. I just want to add that I do think that on some level, of course, not in this complexity, but if I can begin a task or, or a unit or something by giving some of these principles in my own words to the students, they appreciate it better because I think they come in, especially I see this uh, where I teach, they come in with such the mindset of what do I need for the test? Give me the material. Are you wasting my time now? Because I have a grade at the end, which they will argue why it's a 93 and not a 93 and a half, you know? And so sometimes if I'm able to communicate and say, look, this is the grade because of the importance of you learning to communicate and, and so on and, and so forth, then I feel like they can relax and kind of come with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're saying that perhaps not in this specific form, you know, the principles are phrased um, with, you know, the audience in mind was teachers, practitioners, uh, and researchers as well. But in, in you would um, sort of mediate them to the students, and so they understand why they're doing things in a particular way. And I think that's a very good comment. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, it's interesting because very often I look at principles and, and working, you know, coming from a, a bit of a design background. I mean, we, we have design principles, and very often it's just that way to sort of ground us, you know, philosophically ground us in a set of values uh, of what we want to deliver and what we want our, our, our learners, our users to experience. When I think about um, when I think about this in terms of what would it look like in, in a classroom, a face-to-face -face setting, um, I recognize in you know, many years working with adult learners, every single learner is coming in with a set of expectations that's been formed and in many cases biased by the type of language learning they've encountered in school. And so they come into maybe an alternative sort of learning program and are asking, well, where's the, where are the verb conjugation tables? Because that's how they learned verbs in school is they filled out endless verb conjugation tables and where are the flashcards because that's that's the way to learn vocabulary and so when you take an alternative approach whether it's more of like a communicative uh, approach or task-based approach very often learners feel like they are missing something critical because they come with that set of expectation and so if you as a you know either as a classroom teacher, an educator, or someone who's delivering uh, learning via some sort of an online um, self-directed platform can communicate this in some level um, to the learners, then they understand that they are still making progress and improving and getting the foundation, even if they don't have the flashcards, the grammar tables, and all of that sort of thing. So I, I, I see value in that. I, I think that's very important. That, and that speaks to what I usually call the pedagogical contract. So when I start a course, I try to in some way communicate to the students what I expect of them, what they can expect of me, and, and what are the, you know, what are we aiming for, right, together, right? And I think what you're saying is that if, if they come in and they expect A and I'm looking for B, then it's a recipe for a clash. And so I need to, up front in the first lesson on the homepage of the course in Moodle say, look, this course emphasizes ABC, you will learn through XYZ, and this is how I will assess you, right? And, and deriving that or, or kind of tying that to principles perhaps make it, makes it easier for the teachers. Daniel, you have your hand up. Uh, so you're, you're asking about the sort of the, the presentation of principles, and I, and I like the, the principles uh, very much on their own. Um, I uh, also agree with like what Rosalie was saying that some of them are perhaps also maybe teacher oriented. Um, I think that if I uh, were going to try to present this, let's say to a colleague tomorrow, I might want to think about clusters, like clustering some of the principles together, like things having to do a little bit more with the language, 
versus things having to do with the technology versus uh, forms like collaborative and immersive environment. And, and then maybe that would help me make sense a, a little bit more. And then perhaps I could say something about each cluster and that would be the, the message I could give to my students saying, you know, there are four or five different clusters that we're working with. This is how we operationalize them, but maybe at a little bit of a higher, mm -hmm. higher level. That's probably we, we did, we did uh, group them into sort of ah. clusters uh, if in the main page of the, of the principles where they are all listed. They are divided into the clusters that we thought made sense, but you know, you could also <laughs> give us feedback on those clusters themselves yeah, if, if they make sense to you. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm just clicking there now. I see it. Okay. All right. So but, but, but we definitely, we should add a feedback form on the whole set of patterns in terms of their presentation, their organization. If we missed, um, you know, a critical principle that somebody thinks we should add. And, and yes, it's, it's, like I said, it's it's also an issue of how we present them. We did group them into clusters, but maybe it's an issue of visualization or of, of the actual clustering. Okay, so um, time flies when you're having fun, right? At least I'm having fun, so thanks everyone. And um, yeah, let's, let's move on now. Um, so if you recall, uh, I should have had a slide to actually help recall this, but when we talked about the signature pedagogy, we talked about the implicit level, which is a set of values and beliefs, which we touched about uh, on kind of inter alia, for instance, when we talked about uh, me, uh, meaning versus form, and we said there's there's a kind of a social uh, value here as well, uh, and 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 the same in a lot of the other principles. But we didn't really present uh, the set of underlying beliefs and values that that uh, underline this work. Uh, we do have it in the paper, the forthcoming paper, but uh, not today. Um, and then there's you know the the. Um, the structural, uh, the structural level of, of the, the, the design principles, which say what you should do, which reflects what you should do as a teacher, which reflects what we believe about how people learn as learners. So there is that duality between the uh, pedagogical principles and the epistemic principles. Again, we didn't go into that, but some of the principles you would see that in the text, they refer to, to the theory of learning. And then there's a surface level. And the surface level is what actually happens in class. And you know, when we say you should use um, meaningful input or you should use authentic input or, you know, okay, everybody nods and says, yes, that, that sounds good, great, but how do I actually do it, right? And, and that's the thing about principles that they tell you what you should do, but not how you should do it. So here we refer to uh, a framework called design patterns and pattern languages, which comes from the 70s from architecture, a theory of architecture, Christopher Alexander. His aim was actually to democratize architectural design. And he said, you know, architecture relies on um, kind of a long tradition <laughs> of years or thousands of years of tradition of, of knowledge of how to create built environments. And we need a way to share this knowledge with, with a wider population. And he says, well, if you look at cities, towns, buildings, rooms, you can see things that in similar ways, uh, you, you identify that they appear over and over again. And that is because essentially, a lot of times when we design something, we're dealing with problems which appear over and over again in the environment. And so over time, we've developed ways of, of dealing. If somebody has a microphone open, so um, we're getting some noise. Uh, so we've developed ways of dealing with these challenges or problems um, that have been tested over time. And so a design pattern includes uh, three elements. It includes um, a problem or a challenge, the context in which that problem is manifested, and a solution, not necessarily the only or even the best solution, but a solution to, 
to this uh, problem. Now, what we've done is we've uh, started looking for design patterns that reflect the principles that we've presented. And uh, again, in the website in life, you can share the, the link to the website in the chat. Um, we've collected six of these patterns. Today, I'm going to present a couple of them or three of them. And after I do that, then we'll break into rooms and you'll have a hand in trying to articulate your own patterns, right? So here on these slides, I only include the problem and solution uh, on the website. You will see also um, the context and some additional notes about the pattern. So uh, here, the problem that we're looking at is um, that we want to motivate, we're talking about the context is advanced learners, and we want to motivate them to communicate orally in the target language, right? And they, so they feel like they have a good command of the language, but they may be hesitant to communicate orally because you know they don't feel confident enough, or because it's more of an expert, they expose themselves in this way. And one of the ways we found that is effective in motivating learners to communicate orally is through international collaborations or virtual exchanges where we have two groups of learners from different countries that are learning each other's language and they meet and they discuss, um, they, they are given a, a, a meaningful task similar like they would have in, in a single site uh, course, but they have to work on this task through communication with students from the, from the other location. So if I'm learning Spanish and my first language is English, you know, I'll be meeting with a group of students from Spain and half the time we'll speak in Spanish and half in English. Right. Uh, this is this is what uh, anybody actually has an experience of doing something like this. No. OK, so we'll we'll move on or anybody wants to ask any questions before we move on to the next pattern. OK, so I'll move on. Um, so uh, the next pattern is is again is we, we call it oral interaction practice. And the problem is that especially and this is situated specifically within online teaching. So in online teaching, uh, we most of the content, most of the material that students are exposed to is text. And even if they are presented with audiovisual content, then they, they interact with it as consumers, right? They don't have enough uh, opportunities to uh, exercise their oral skills. And hence, these skills often get uh, mm -hmm. left behind, right? So what we want to do is, is, again, give students opportunities for oral interaction. The solution we, we found, and this is from you know, courses that Lyas run and her colleagues, and this is a sort of a standard practice in their case, is that they give students a task which uh, requires them to engage in oral interaction through a video call. That could be a simulation, it could be, you know, discuss your pets, or and, and of course it has to be a meaningful task in which they have to open a video call with a friend uh, from, uh, from the course and have a conversation in the target language. After they finish the call, I mean, they record it uh, live, they upload it to the LMS and then using their, whatever technology, you know, there's a lot of solutions for this, the teachers annotate this recording with their feedback. Um, Rosalie, you want to say something about uh, visual exchanges? I'll go back to the uh... Uh, yeah, uh, just that uh, they're, they're, they're extremely helpful and successful, but we they have to be really carefully organized and monitored throughout because we we always run the risk of uh, 
of internet uh, internet intercommun uh, intercultural breakdowns. Yeah. You know, there's all ki all kinds of other affective and cultural issues that come into play here that, uh, you know, beyond language. And of course, it, it, it again brings together the, the intimate uh, connection between language and culture and, 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 and cultural baggage and, 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 and our own, our own uh, axiomatic system. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're indeed a, ph a phenomenal uh, teaching task uh, and, and way of uh, uh, engaging. Um, and I think ultimately um, a very uh, authentic, um, exercise, but risky too. Uh, very, very good point. You know, as I say, with great power comes great responsibility. So I think it's precisely because of the authenticity and meaningfulness of these experiences that uh, those risks arise because we're interacting with real people from a different culture. And so uh part of of the organization of of the it's not just about i think monitoring communication and dealing with kind of these frictions where they arise but probably more also about uh preparing the students for these possible friction raising their awareness before the meet before the exchange and so on right right hey, can i add something sorry uh, I, if i can add something i, I sorry sure. uh Leia. um I, I still remember i was the part of the ivlp the state department U state department program when uh, 10 uh, journalists from israel and the palestinian authority came to the united states in, in october 2010 and uh, some people were like in a cultural shock because of things even like you know the american um understatement and uh, what they should be insulted by or what they don't understand when people are saying certain things so even it was like organized by the state department it organized beautifully there was still some places where like mm, in advance if they would guide people uh, maybe less even the israeli more the palestinians just understand that what it really means when they talking in a way using certain words etc right yeah. I think I think that's that's a very relevant point, and um, what I would like to you know um, note is that there are many virtual exchanges that have been organized around intercultural issues. Actually, forget about language; they were like there to solve intercultural uh, situations. And I remember one project, the Solia project, and I'll add it here in the chat, which did that with. Um, like Arab speaking countries and, um, and Americans. So, and in the point of the virtual exchange was actually to talk about culturally um, loaded um, problematic issues. And they were, bring, they were brought to the shore. They had facilitators working with, with, with the students who had this, you know, one-to-one -one exchanges. And it was, I think it's an example of something that you can build in the task, right? In the in the exchange itself. So yeah. I'll add that in the chat, the project. But it's it's definitely, you know, uh, I think it strengthens our, our um, you know, we were talking about this earlier this week, Lan, myself, about the issue of virtual exchanges as a specific format to focus on and to elaborate because, it's very powerful, but also has a lot of uh, a lot of risks and frictions and things that you need to get right in order for it to work. Uh, so, so thanks. So, uh, we'll move on to to uh, probably the last pattern we'll look at today, which we call tangram feedback. So, if you think about, you know, all the principles that we've presented. And all these have implications in terms of, of assessment and feedback, right? Now, if we really want to assess all the different language skills and all the, all the learning objectives and so on in every act, in every, every event in, in the classroom, you know, that remains, it creates a just unmanageable demand in terms of the learner and more so the teacher, right? So the idea is that uh, when, when we talked about tangram, there's this, you know, the, uh, the visual metaphor of having different bits which have different shapes and different sizes. And so when you design a course, 
and say, okay, these are the principles that I put into the design. These are the things that I need to assess, both in terms of the specific learning objectives and in terms of, of the epistemic principles and so on. And say, okay, so in this course, I will need one task that gives, um, you know, like uh, uh, we had the, the sorry, the, the previous one, one oral interaction practice, one written assignment, and and so on. You know, so so decide in one group uh, exercise and one individual exercise. So in the group exercise, we talked earlier about the challenge of of assessment, individual assessment in in collaborative work and. And so, you know, you, you build that balance of, of the different elements in the design of the course as a whole. So uh, you get a kind of a, a balance and a good mix that um, sort of balances between the workload of the teachers and, and the students and the objectives and principles that you want to put in place. Um, any, any more questions on these patterns or if somebody had a chance to kind of browse through the site and, and look at any of the other patterns and you want to comment on them? Because we, we just presented these three as examples. Again, there's a few more on the website which we won't have time to go through today. Uh, but uh, just if somebody wants to comment or ask a question before we move on. Okay, so we move on, right? This is where the real fun begins. So what we're going to do now is we're going to split you into groups, i.e. Zoom rooms, and um, you will have, um, so we'll do a random split into group. Oh, oh no. I just realized I don't, oh, yeah, I do have breakout rooms. Sorry, sorry. So we're going to split you into, let's say, seven rooms. And uh, what we want you to do, well, I'll do that in a second. Um, we have created a Jamboard. I don't know if, if you've used Jamboard before, but it's really very, very simple uh, tool for collaborative work, essentially a kind of a very simplistic collaborative whiteboard, but that is uh, uh, organized in slides. So you will see at the top of the screen, um, you, can, you can kind of scroll through the slides. And what we want you to do is go first to a slide that's called, let's say if you're team four, i.e. room four in Zoom, go to room four pattern storming. Right, and then give that exercise 20 minutes. And I'll, I'll explain in a minute what I want you to do in pattern storming. And then you move to the other slide. And so you select one pattern from the pattern storming board and you elaborate it on the next slide. After you've done that, you can choose whether you know, so you might want to look at what the other teams are doing, and then you can put post-it notes um, on on the on the uh, other um, post-it notes on the other uh, boards, or you can write another one. Now I know uh, some people here are, are um, saying you know, have a problem in opening your microphone, that's fine. If you can't open your microphone and, and your camera, you can still participate textually. Uh, so let me show you what we want to do in the patent storming. So when you go into the patent storming board, uh, first we want you to write your names. And that is because we, I mean, we're, we're going to actually use, hopefully, yes, Eli, can you stick the link to the Jamboard in the chat while I'm talking? Uh, somebody asked for it now. Um, so, so first of all, write your names because we might use this as data in, in our next paper or whatever. And um, so we want to give you credit. Uh, so please write your names uh, and an email on the uh, right hand side of the board and then um, use post-it notes to either throw in problems 
or solutions. Sometimes it's easier to start with a problem. I was teaching a course and I had this really big problem of getting students to do X. Or I had a problem because you know I wanted them to do X and they did Y or you know, whatever. Sometimes it's easier to start with a solution. Uh, so sometimes you say, look, I did something and it worked really well. So you put that down on a note um, and then you go back to thinking, okay, but when I say it worked really well, what was the problem it, it actually solved, right? So, um, so, so again, you start either from the problem or from the solution, whatever works better for you. And then uh, you think about the principles from, from the 16 principles that we shared earlier that this solution embodies, right? So you look at them and say, oh, actually, this solution is really spot on collaborative working. This is exactly talking about uh, meaningful input and so on, right? So, so to find the principles that you think relate to, to this problem that you, uh, and then solution, sorry, to the solution. Uh, and finally, add examples. So you say, you know, this is something I've been doing for 15 years and it always works. Great. Now tell me a story. So last year, I had a class of these kind of students and we were studying this content and this is how I did it. So get very, very concrete. Give us a real, a good story, a narrative. Right now, the idea about this exercise is that you know it's it's a brainstorming exercise. So everyone dumps notes on the on the board simultaneously. You can talk or not while you're doing whatever works for you and your team. But the idea is to get as much stuff on the board as possible and draw lines between the problems and the solutions and the principle that they reflect. Right. After you've done this, I said 20 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> the next step is to select one triplet, as you recall, the pattern is a triplet of problem context solution. So select one triplet of pattern problem solution and articulate it in detail. Right. So you usually it's easier to start with the solution then explain the problem that you were trying to work on and um, <clears throat> and then go through the context. Uh, it's important to note, uh, uh, well, then add an example and it's important to note limitations like we had earlier when we were talking about, you know, when we had this uh, uh, purpose for to communicate the pattern about virtual explain uh, um, exchanges. Then people raise some concerns that you know issues that might arise in a virtual exchange. And you know if you want if you want to do this, you need to take care of this and that. Right. So um, okay. So, so that's that's your task. Um, Again, I know I see some people have to leave. We're sorry to see you go, but we're glad if you found this useful so far. Um, and and again, if you can't participate orally, you can participate textually. So hopefully, those of you who are in an office environment can still take part in this exercise. Uh, I will now open the rooms. I think. Well, probably we can do with with five rooms. I think uh, uh, that would give us a good um, yeah five or no no let's let's make it even four rooms. <laughs> I see a lot of people need to leave. So so I'm opening the rooms now and we'll assign you automatically. And again, and you have the link to the Jamboard in the chat. We'll post it again. And Lion and myself will just kind of pop in uh, and out of the rooms and uh, try to help you as much as we can. Okay, we'll be back here in an hour. Well, first of all, thank you all for, for staying um, with us and, and engaging in this. It was, uh, I definitely enjoyed kind of dropping into the, to the conversations. 
Um, so what I, we'd like to do now is just have a quick presentation from the uh, from the groups, and if you can just uh, tell us what you've you know what you've discussed and what you've kind of found out and so on. So group one, who wants to talk? Michael, Alice, Nathan, who wants to present your work? Are you here actually, or have you left? Is, is anybody here from group one? They might still be on break, maybe. Yeah, I think the rooms are closed. Oh, they might be on break, you think, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, while we're waiting for that, so we might just start from uh, group two. Um, while we're getting organized. Oh, uh, Nathan, do you want to, were you in group one or group uh, four? I was in group one, but uh, the woman uh, who was in charge uh, went back to Germany in the middle, so. Mm. She has all okay. the books and I don't see Michael here either. Alice. Uh, closed her camera so so do you want to share with us just some insight from the uh discussion you had or or should we move on to group two whatever you prefer i, I think we'll wait and see if michael comes and he has okay. the notes okay that's fine uh while we're waiting i just dropped uh, a link to a whatsapp group in the chat so if any of you want to continue the discussion after we conclude the workshop, then you're welcome to join that WhatsApp group. Um, so let's, uh, perhaps we shall move on to group two and then we can come back to group one later. Um, La, are you sharing screen now? Yeah, so do you wanna to move to group two and who wants to uh, present? I believe Winnie wants to begin. No, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We had a lot of um, ideas floating around. Mm -hmm. um, uh, motivation, uh, I can hardly read this, so excuse me. And we, we ended up uh, talking a lot about uh, cheating, students cheating on the assignments. So we basically um, decided to go with the cheating element. Okay, so okay. shall we move to the next slide? Yes, please do. And then see the, the pattern, right? Yeah, so uh, we started off uh, finding what the problems were, or do you want the solutions first? Just, just go in, through it. Okay. In any way that makes right. sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, the problem. Um, we felt the, the problem was achieving an authentic assessment with the student expression in English. Um, but students cheat because, and there are a variety of reasons why they cheat. Social pressure, uh, if they coming from the Arab sector, it's very, um, it's in every sector, it's a done thing. Students cheat, what can you do? They're anxious about failing, uh, they're anxious about their stance in the class, where they sit in the class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the context we felt, and please, Orit, jump in if you feel um, you need to add something. Uh, the context was uh, our courses are usually late in the evening, so the students feel they have, oh, what do we need to learn English for? This is the most ridiculous thing at four o'clock in the evening, starting to learn a language. And it is, it's, it's very um, not, uh, it's not a good thing. Uh, we get no support from the administration on this. And the message is, you just got to do what you've got to do and 
the students are overworked, overwhelmed, and trying to make it through with their own studies without having to deal with another course. Uh, but they have to have English in order to get their BA. And that is something that's kind of lost in the translation sometimes. Um, our suggestions for the solution was to change the mode of learning and assessment um, so that there'd be less uh, percentage on the final exam, uh, uh, less um, yeah, percentage on the final exam. Um, more integrated skills, tasks, group work, so they can collaborate and feel supported. Um, but the students have to show that they've actually worked as well. So how we do that is through methods of having them work in a small group, for example, and they have to just, they have to show what each member in that group has done in the task. Orit, do you want to continue? Uh, sure, sure. So we talked in terms of the limitations that while the solution for group work is, I think so many of us know, right, is, is they support each other, uh, so-called, you know, weaker student, let's say in vocabulary or in speak can take a bit of a back role or be supported by a student who might be stronger in speaking and they can kind of share that. But then again, what we said about the limitations is that absolutely uh we have to find a way to make sure everybody's working it's you have to put a lot of thought into this make sure that you see all the students working and that they see that you see that they're each working so not allow anyone to disappear right like they do like a student that you know in the old way of teaching i i could teach and then realize i haven't spoken to a student even because they just sit there do their multiple choice and disappear so here I love the fact that, okay, I have to see them, but then I have to find a way to see everybody. And maybe we should also add into the context, large class sizes. We have not been able to get yeah. the administration to reduce class size as well. And, and then another limitation, which we decided we just uh, in the class, that, in our group that we're all fine with is the fact that you have to take into account that again, I'm putting in parentheses, these weaker students are going to be supported or even some of the work will be done by the stronger students who also want the higher grade yeah. and to kind of be okay with that to understand that there's going to be some sleep slippage that you're not going to be able to control completely and to kind of say you know what so if a student instead of uh, 80 in my class is going to end up with an 82 and a half because that group work somehow bumped them i just have to be okay with that maybe that's something that's okay um, so uh, notes, did we not have any notes? We did have notes. I don't know what happened here. Huh, let me see if-, if um... you, you can add them later, I think, because uh, first no, of I all- I think we did. So maybe it just needs to be refreshed or- No, I think I, it's somehow they disappeared because when I look at it, I don't see the notes. Yeah, here we go. Uh, we said, uh, will there be cheating that we are enabling in some way? Just, it didn't update. I may not have pressed it correctly. Okay. And I so know. we're wondering, in fact, here we go. I guess it showed now, is wh whether we're in fact to be really careful and to just, make sure that we're not creating a situation where in, indeed we're only making it more possible for them to not do work rather than communicate we appreciate each of you and want to see each of you working and don't worry you will be able to give it a chance to get a good grade and so that was something we thought of but uh, in terms of examples we actually had a lot of stories that we told and we didn't exactly have time to write this down and i don't know if you would like emails later i would love to Share for myself, just share a few stories, but we did have a few stories that we shared. And uh, Winnie and myself and Shira as well, we talked about speaking with the students in the info, we were talking about this yesterday, the informal settings when they're coming to speak to you or when you're in the breakout room with them, when you get that informal speech with them to encourage them and to say, I'm here, I support you. Please don't just choose this subject for your presentation because you think it'll be the easiest. Please let, trust me enough to tell you that I'm going to support you to get a good grade. Again, that, that grade they're always worried about, please let the journey be enjoyable and trust us that we can take you there in a meaningful way. Yeah. yeah so there's, I, I, to summarize, there's, you know, in terms of how do we get them to cheat less and really focus on the learning, 
Uh, there are issues which relate to authentic tasks, which may increase motivation and make it harder to cheat uh, about kind of legitimizing group work and but then making them accountable for their contribution to the work and about the teacher presence about saying look yes i do have to give you a grade in the end of the class of the course but that's not really what matters and you know right? it's more about the journey and so on but that's a mindset for them they have to change their mindset to understand that Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and wouldn't say that doesn't matter. I think when when we tell them that, it, it's probably it's hard for the you know it's like me telling my daughter please stop being on Instagram. It doesn't matter for her, right? It's like you don't get me, mom. You have no idea. You you know what I'm saying? But but to find the language to say yes, I understand you have a grade. Mm -hmm. I and and I will give you a chance to earn that grade, but please also come with me on this journey and don't just. Do sure. you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, so here's a challenge for you uh, to try to think of a, of a name for this because you you've kind of come up with something which is I think quite dense and complex and 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 meaningful and that makes it hard to find a good name for it. So uh, you can you know think about that and I think we can be in touch definitely by email or WhatsApp or whatever after the workshop and see you know if you want to take this further we'll be very happy to work on this with you uh anybody wants to comment on this before we move on to the because i'm uh, conscious of time so i think we should probably move on to the other next teams but before we do if somebody wants to comment on this okay um i think uh nathan your teammates aren't back right so or should we move on to team three? Yes, go to team three. Okay. So team three. Wow, a lot of work here on the on the storm board, right? Um, do you want to tell us a bit about this or do you want to jump straight into the pattern? Um, hi, I'm Iran. Uh, we've been a great team. Uh, Nina Newman, Jennifer Dorman, and... Um, Maite uh, from Madrid and Maite Cambioro, right? And if I remember the family name. So um, thank you, first of all, uh, for letting us. So we, yeah, we, we started by like throwing everything out there and then we focused on um, what we mainly went with the experience of students speaking in class or like the um, inability, like the frightening fear that, that makes them go silent because um, they are being afraid. Actually, we heard it both from students during the Global Ethics Startup Awards um, um, quick. It was uh, like a week uh, of voice assistance and from uh, people, entrepreneurs uh, in, in like innovation. So students are just afraid to speak in class because there's the, the fear that they will, it, won't turn out well and uh and they will be mocked and judged and it will harm their confidence maybe the, you know they be a, a running gag afterwards after them and nobody wants to to come there so <clears throat> we called our um our um, project safe and sound um because we want people to be sound that like to make sounds and we want them to 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 feel safe when they're doing it so um i'll start by creating a safe environment let's say shall we move on to the next oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so we thought about like other other things that we yeah we'll just um everybody can can see it and uh we have great things but um let, let's go forward so the problem challenge you want to engage in a conversation with others in english but you can't because you lack confidence and they're afraid of being mocked because your english isn't good enough um so um, the solution is that the students have a safe environment where he or she won't be judged harshly for mistakes with a partner that you know what to expect of, use modeled conversation, record yourself in advance or, or, or in real time, practice in small groups. Uh, also, like this is like side note, our, our company is dealing with conversational video bots. So this, this is a learning tool that we use and um, uh, also is a, a, a able to help with this as we see right uh, these days. Um, the, the context is like the speaking activities in classroom, social interactions in real life. So the examples is like to find some English speaking friends, um, even in class, even it 
should be maybe organized by the teacher, by the principal uh, that would love some company. For example, I had I gave the example when I was uh, uh, in high school. I, my English was not very good. So I covered uh, for three months my favorite basketball team. And they had like American Jewish players coming uh, to Israel without their families. And they just searched for company. So I would stay after practices and talk with them, even like some visiting them at their homes. And they would just have like friendly conversations for hours. And that's what basically the linchpin of my um, um, better English. So, uh, but not everybody is covering uh, basketball teams. So, um, uh, uh, Nina and uh, and uh, Jennifer and um, uh, Mike, they gave some great, great examples from their um, everyday practice. For example, um, they play with students in classroom. They tell them that something happened and they, they have to ask questions that the teacher can only ask by yes, no, maybe, like things like that to understand what really happened. And they just have to use vocabulary and, and good questioning and, and, and curiosity to find out what happened. Also, uh, a great example was uh, using surveys, for example, pairing the students in like twos and have them uh, doing dialogues, like uh, asking their friends what they love to do the most, like about their pets, about their families, for example, like everyday items from their lives so they can like um, have this safe environment where nobody will uh, do it. Other thing, uh, the, the limitations are that it if we're using the conversational video tools, for example, it does require some kind of technology in the classroom, not like high tech ones, but internet connection, for example. I know that not everybody has it as well. Uh, it requires the social interaction, preferably face to face, which is a problem in the COVID area, uh, in the COVID era, where some uh, countries turn out still have limitations, quarantines, or, or like um, strict uh, laws. And um, avoid publishing things online, especially at the beginning, because um, we talked about, for example, let's go to, to post something on Facebook in English and Twitter in English and everything else. If your English is not good enough, this can haunt you afterwards for years. And uh, we talked, we joked about like, the first message by Jack Dorsey of just setting at my tutor. So it became famous, but a lot of people, you know, like posting something uh, in, in very bad English and afterwards, like after years after it became famous, they're going back and then mocking them for this one. So um, this was our latest. And then any other things to add, Nina or Maite? Or Jennifer, if, if you're back. All right. Um, so this was um, um, Kambler, Kambler, Dorman, Newman, Soroka et al. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, Nina, I think you didn't put your email on the previous slide. So. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Just so we can get back to you with this, I think it is. Um, uh, Elia, do you want to comment on this about this issue, safe and sound? Sorry, it, it always takes me a while to find the unmute button. Um, so I think I really like this button, and I think it's you know very relevant for for the one of the my obsessions, which is um, oral conversations um, and oral interactions between learners and definitely finding, you know, finding a way where they feel comfortable um, is, is, is hugely important. And um, it, it also neatly relates to some of the principles that we have, um, that we have listed on our, you know, you can find on, on the webpage that, but that we have been working on. So um, yeah. I think it's just really, and I love the title, I have to say. That's what happens when you put an ex-journalist uh, to give a title <laughs> for something. Yeah. So I want to, uh, I, I mean, I think there's a lot to discuss here. I think there's the connection with conversational bots and also I see a, a connection to games and gaming as well. Uh, but I think we should move on to, to group four because we're really almost hitting the hour. Um, so, and I think definitely the, I'm intri intrigued by these circles on the board. So I don't know if, if somebody from group four can walk us through this. Yeah, hi everybody. So we were uh, three active members in our group and uh, Dania was uh, contributing by uh, texting, by writing. 
Um, so we uh, brainstormed some problems as a first step and uh, what uh, emerged were areas around audio, around um, also confidence to speak, uh, but then there were some uh, similarities in terms of thoughts about uh, feedback for the learners and explanations and, uh, and support. Um, so then we converged towards the idea of uh, looking closer at, uh, at feedback. So on the next uh, part, we identified the, um, the problem, just one second, so I move it as well. Yeah, so we identified the problem in the following way that you want to receive regular and tailored feedback, but the technology does not allow it for it at that moment in time, because it doesn't have the language areas feedback computed and available for retriever and for the uh, use of the learners. So we thought uh, that the context could be an online language learning environment, whether a website or an app. And the learners are people who are adults and they're studying on their own. And we brainstormed some solutions in the time that we had. So if we uh, provided the generic language area uh, feedback, so if we wrote down um, some generic um, pieces of feedback that we could input into the into the software, into the technology, and uh, this um, tailored, at this point, feedback would uh, be retrieved. So when the learners make choices in their learning path, they would get some, some feedback. For example, if um, for pronunciation, maybe they would have some uh, uh, feedback on uh, specific words or vowels, or um, if they do a uh, uh, exercises or tests, they uh, can have answers to the wrong options that they would hypothetically pick. So instead of having no answers, no explanations, no offer, no uh, clarifications, they would get uh, the, this feedback. Uh, we also thought about uh, tracking and visualizing accuracy rates based on the learner's uh, error data. So by learning and uh, Within the digital environments, we can see and we can uh, analyze the, the, their learning experience and we can see where they're struggling, what areas are more difficult than others, and maybe those pieces of information could be fed back into the um, content as well, because you would want to focus on what learners find difficult. And in terms of limitations, we said that um, automaticity, computational and computational linguist expertise and power, budget, the space, the physical space on the screen might be challenging for formative feedback because it might be lengthy in terms of wording. And then the decisions that need to be made on the language areas that you wanna provide feedback on because there are many language areas that you would wanna comment on, but which ones do you uh, actually comment on? And we were also had some notes. So we uh, thought about the learners and the students, how they prefer to receive this feedback. Perhaps some don't really find the writing feedback as effective as perhaps a spoken audio or a human person or a teacher or a visual uh, representation. And the example we took was from within uh, an application where learners were preparing for a test and they were making their choices. However, there was no feedback or explanation. There was no answer rationale to why their choices were right or wrong. And with, in this particular example, when uh, in a, another iteration of the software, the explanations, the answer rationales were added that added uh, learning value because then they could have the um, sort of meaning of why uh, an answer choice is better than, than another one. Mm -hmm. so this is our part. Thank you. So first of all, um... I think you know obviously having having uh, meaningful and specific feedback is is the I think the strongest driver of learning. So definitely this is something that we always need to try to to provide. And then there's the tension between you know the 
the desire to give regular tailored feedback, but then, you know, we only have so much time in, in a day, students only have so much time in a day. So it's, it's really about, first of all, letting students choose when they want feedback. And um, we wrote a, set a few years ago, I was working with a group of colleagues and we had a, a whole set of pa design patterns on feedback. So one, one pattern was, for instance, to give students a feedback budget. So every student can ask me to give them personalized feedback, let's say three times in the semester, right? That's their budget. And, uh, and they decide when they ask for it. And that allows me to sort of manage my time as well. Um, another thing is that, you know, if you build a quiz in Moodle, then you can put in feedback for different correct and wrong answers and so on. Uh, conversational bots Elan can tell us all about or you know another a very powerful tool to do automated feedback uh, and you build the bot runs and it works for all the students uh, so this is you know obviously another area where we can expand endlessly uh, unfortunately we've I said we've uh, hit the the clock and I see a lot of people have already had to leave uh, so I think uh, perhaps the right thing to do is, is to conclude now, but leave the room open. I'll, um, just if anybody wants to say any last comments or questions about this, um, what we presented and what we did together today, of course, you're welcome to do it. And I'll leave the room open for a few more minutes just for kind of, you know, just like in a real workshop where we... <laughs> hang around for a bit and have a glass of water or something. Yeah. So Thank any you, Okay, so I'll close the recording now.